Hey there! My name is Sherry, and normally I do content that's related to video games and their history. This video doesn't pertain to either of those, because it's about a very special trip I took recently. Ever since I was in high school, I've wanted to see one of the big cities up in the United States' Pacific Northwest. Seattle, Washington. Over the course of a decade, I saved up bits and pieces hoping I'd get to see the Emerald City one day. And as of this summer, it finally became a reality. With how many photos and videos I took while I was there, I thought it'd be fun to do something like this to share how my trip went. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. First things first, I had to get to an airport, which meant going back to my hometown of Atlanta, Georgia. It's been a long time since I still lived here, but I still come down here occasionally for things like conventions and family get-togethers. If you've never explored Atlanta beyond its airport, it's sometimes called the City in the Forest because of its ample tree cover, which is a pretty good thing to be known for instead of our awful and confusing highways. But I shouldn't snark at my hometown too much. It's actually quite a beautiful city, and if you ever have a chance to see it, you really should. For as much time as I've spent in Atlanta, I had never actually been to the airport until this trip. To be honest, it kind of looks like a time capsule back to the 1980s, or maybe the 90s. That was a pretty big decade here, after all. They always say that Hartsfield-Jackson is the world's busiest airport, and that was definitely the affirming impression I got as I walked into the domestic terminal. The actual interior, though? Honestly, a bit of a ghost town. Maybe it was because I was flying out on the Thursday, maybe it was a lingering effect of COVID-19 on travel, or maybe it was because the bulk of travelers were international, but there was something weirdly comforting about getting to enjoy a casual walk to the gate I needed to be at. I wasn't able to get a direct flight to Seattle, so what I had to do instead was fly out to Denver, Colorado, and catch a connecting flight from there. Easy enough on paper, but it didn't take long for me to experience my first airline delay, as the plane I was taking to Denver ran into technical issues before departing, meaning that all of us had to get back in the gate and wait for them to complete maintenance checks. This lasted for about an hour, and it all boiled down to... Have you tried turning it off and back on again? Ah, but I shouldn't complain too much. An hour's not that long of a wait, it could have been worse, and once we all got back on board, departure was quick and seamless. Just like that, we were off! According to the flight map, we'd be passing over not only Georgia and Colorado, but also Alabama, Mississippi, Tennessee, Arkansas, Oklahoma, and Kansas between the two. That's a lot of land to cover, and it certainly sounds exciting, but really, you didn't miss much. Just a whole lot of this, and this, and this. Oh, but this lake was pretty cool. Not entirely sure where it was, but I love the two little islands out there in the middle of it. Not gonna lie, it made me think of the location from Breath of the Wild. Surely, there's a puzzle leading to a Korok seed down there. Things were pretty uneventful up in the air, until we crossed the state line between Oklahoma and Kansas, and the view outside the plane window looked as if we had entered a portal into Antarctica. Perhaps this is how they get the penguins to the zoo. I'm on to you, Kansans. After escaping the frigid southern extremities of the world, we entered Colorado, a state where the scenery was especially yellow-orange. I mean, sure, I saw plenty of that over Oklahoma, too, but it was gradual there. Considering we left the South Pole to enter the Centennial State, it was a more dramatic contrast. All these squares with different crops and colors reminded me of loading up a new world in Minecraft and just casually flying around. I don't think a lot of people would find this kind of scenery remarkable, but it was kind of fascinating to me, in a weird way. At some point while we were over Colorado, I assume we flew right into a large cloud, because the view out of the window suddenly became an endless white void with nothing distinguishable in sight. You know that episode of SpongeBob SquarePants where Squidward tries to get away from SpongeBob and Patrick and ends up in literal nowhere? Yeah, that was exactly what it felt like. Thankfully, the white void didn't last for more than several minutes. I could finally stop looking away from the windows and see the arid ground below again. One turbulent descent later, I had arrived in Denver, 
home of the current Stanley Cup champions. It was... well... I was arriving in the Mile High City for the first time, and in the middle of a particularly nasty heat wave. Now, I knew that altitude sickness was a thing, thanks to the city's reputation with visiting sports teams, but I had grossly underestimated how much of an effect it was going to have on me. The combination of altitude sickness and high temperatures was anything but fun, and the delirium I was feeling only reinforced how lost I was inside of Denver International. I felt awful, even regretting my decision to come out this far. And thanks to a glitch in the system, I was stuck here in the orange hell for a few additional hours. It felt like an entire day suffering inside the airport, but the ball did eventually get rolling as the sun was beginning to set in Colorado. Entering the pressurized cabin of the plane felt like discovering an oasis in the middle of a desert, and I found great comfort in knowing that what was likely to be the worst part of the trip was over. Finally, I was leaving Denver. Next stop, Seattle Tacoma International, or SeaTac for short, since the airport is located roughly halfway between the two cities. This time, we'd be flying through the rest of Colorado, as well as Wyoming, Idaho, a small part of Oregon, and the southern half of Washington State. Unfortunately, because of how late at night it was, I couldn't see any of the natural landscape below us, but the cluster of lights from an increasingly distant Denver partially made up for it. The longer this flight went on, the more I felt like I was just about pinging off of the airplane walls. Holy shit, I kept thinking. It's finally happening! I'm actually going to Seattle! Holy shit! I couldn't tell where we were through the dark of the night, until, all of a sudden, there it was. A sudden galaxy of lights piercing through the window of the plane. We were beginning to make our descent into Seattle a city I had dreamt of seeing as a starry-eyed teenager. And now here I was, nearly a decade later, an adult with the stars returning to my eyes. It was just about midnight when I got off the plane and stepped into SeaTac, and while I thought Hartsfield-Jackson was a pretty empty place when I left earlier that morning, SeaTac this late at night was basically empty, a feeling that I once again found myself enchanted by. To such an extent, in fact, that I forgot to take any photos or videos. Because of the local time here on the Pacific Coast, the only reasonable way to leave the airport was to take the Light Link Rail, which was totally fine by me, because I always love getting to ride trains. Kind of a shame they're not very popular here in the United States, though. The station was out in the open air, and it was such a dramatic difference from Denver. It felt like a cool, autumnal evening as I stood on the platform waiting for the train to arrive. And let me tell you, once it came, there was something magical about that train ride from the airport into the heart of Seattle, especially as we approached the twin stadiums of T-Mobile Park and Lumen Field. I tried my best to record the approach from the interior of the train car, but the difference in lighting meant that my reflection got in the way of the recording. I regret to inform you that I am a real-life 1 out of 10, out here to ring a 9 out of 10 city. In total, it took about 30 minutes to ride the train from the airport to the station closest to the hotel where I was staying. I regret not getting any photos of the streets after arrival, but at the same time, I felt like I looked like an open invitation to be mugged, carrying around a luggage bag this late at night. So, I made a beeline for the hotel, checked in, and immediately went to bed. The adventure could wait until the morning. Day number one in Seattle began with me waking up at about 5.30 in the morning. I wasn't sure if that was just me being excited to be here, or if my body was still operating on Eastern Standard Time, thinking it was 8.30 instead. Whatever the reason, I spent some time appreciating the view from the hotel room, including this absolute lad on a nearby building, before going on a morning walk. I had a tour of Lumen Field on the schedule, but it wasn't until well afternoon, so I had plenty of time to kill. People joke about how culturally different the East Coast states and West Coast states are, but one of the things that immediately stuck with me about Seattle was how casual and relaxed everything was. Throughout the entire trip, I couldn't stop obsessing over this, even though it was such a duh thing, given how far I had traveled to get here. Of course things would be different. Like I said earlier, I grew up in Atlanta, so that's my primary metric for comparing cities. 
Even around lunchtime and in the afternoon, I never had to wait more than a couple minutes at a crossing, there were plenty of buses and streetcars in regular service, and the only crowded places I came across were touristy spots like the Seattle Center, the Waterfront, and Pike Place Market. Likewise, the only roads with significant traffic were those closest to Interstate 5, and I found the city pretty easy to navigate by foot. The big highlight of the morning walk was when I went down to Alaskan Way, the street that forms Seattle's waterfront. I don't know what it is about dockyards, piers, and boats that attract me so, but it's something I find very relaxing. There's no shortage of things to do on the waterfront, either. The Seattle Aquarium takes up an entire pier, there's a Ferris wheel on another, and all sorts of eclectic, touristy stores decorate the remainder. I even spotted this little friend trying to hide in plain sight, as well as a statue of famed folk musician turned restaurant owner Ivor Hagland. Yes, you could even sit with him. And your friend Sherry had to do so in the dorkiest way he could think of. After getting a generous helping of the invigorating smell of sea salt, it was getting close to noon, so I began to head in the direction of Lumen Field, which meant going through Pioneer Square. This is an especially fascinating part of Seattle, because it's where you can see many of the first buildings that were erected after the Great Fire of 1889 destroyed the original city. It's also home to Smith Tower, which used to be the tallest building west of the Mississippi River from 1914 to 1931, as well as the tallest building in Seattle until the completion of the much more iconic Space Needle in 1962. After taking time to marvel at the art and ample tree cover in the area, I had some of the best coffee I've ever tasted at a laid-back venue named Zeitgeist, which was conveniently located across from the stadium. I was practically shivering with excitement as I approached Lumen Field. This was a stadium I had seen hundreds of times on television and social media, but now I was getting to see with my own eyes just how massive and impressive it was. The tour was scheduled to meet up at the team store built into the stadium, and let me tell you, walking through those doors was like I had died and gone to heaven. There were so many amazing scarves, and hats, and shirts, and socks, and glasses, but I only had so much luggage space, let alone money to spend. Plus, if I bought anything now, it would mean having to carry it during the entire stadium tour, which was about to begin. Built between 2000 and 2002 to replace the former King Dome, Lumen Field is currently shared between three of the city's major league teams. Their American football team, the Seattle Seahawks, their men's soccer team, Seattle Sounders FC, and most recently, their women's soccer team, the OL Reign, who moved in from Tacoma earlier this year. Since the Sounders were the next team to use the stadium, Lumen Field was in soccer configuration, which meant the uppermost levels were covered up and off-limits. We were still going high above the streets, though, so now might be a good time to mention that I have a bit of a problem with heights. Especially when I don't have something tangible and sturdy nearby to ground myself. That's why being on an airplane didn't bother me, but standing on the flagpole platform at Lumen Field did. Thankfully, it was only a brief part of the tour, and once we went back down, I was able to get some color back to my skin, as well as some really nice panoramic shots of the stadium. We even got to demonstrate the famous acoustics by yelling out some Seahawks chants to the other side of the stadium and hearing them echo back. And after that, the tour went indoors. Our guide took us into several of the premium suites, as well as the broadcast booths and even the press conference room for the Seahawks, where I tried my best to give a rousing speech despite not knowing much about football. I will admit, though, I'm kind of curious about watching a Seahawks game or two, thanks to the enthusiasm of our tour guide. The last thing we did on the tour was go through the tunnel and onto the field, an opportunity to finally touch grass, even if it was fake. Because the stadium crew were getting the field ready for the Sounders, we couldn't walk on anything more than a small pocket in the corner, but that was perfectly fine with me, because I was able to get a decent photo of the team's championship banners hanging from the western roof. With the tour over, and a little bit of shopping at the Sounders team store later, it was now halfway between lunch and dinner time, so I made a stop at the Merchant's Cafe, which bills itself as Seattle's oldest restaurant, having opened in 1890. 
It was a charming little place, and I was enjoying my meal until I started to feel very sick. As it turns out, I might be an idiot. Because after a day of constant movement, a little bit of accidental ankle twisting, and ignoring how I felt until I couldn't stop hearing my heartbeat in my head, I had managed to push myself way too far on just the first day. What I needed was rest, even though it wasn't exactly how I wanted the day to end, but it was starting to become thoroughly painful just trying to walk. So I limped back to the hotel with leftovers in hand. On the bright side, I got to spend the evening watching some of the local news channels from Washington State. Again, that probably sounds very boring to most people, but I thought it was fascinating stuff. Making a little bit of good out of the bad, as it were. Day two in Seattle was the big day, considering I had scheduled this trip around a Sounders game at Lumen Field. The game day festivities wouldn't actually start until closer to evening, so I thought I'd enjoy a more mildly paced morning walk, and then return to the hotel to rest my legs before heading for the stadium. Since I already toured most of the waterfront, I decided to use this morning walk to stop by another one of Seattle's most iconic landmarks, Pike Place Market. With all its shops and restaurants spanning the complex, Pike Place kind of feels like its own miniature contained city. However, I only got to see a small portion of the market, because I'd be lying if I said that the crowds of people shoved into narrow hallways didn't make me nervous about bringing COVID-19 or monkeypox back home. At the very least, I got to go through the corridor under the market, leading to one of Seattle's most charming, and grossest, attractions. The Gum Wall. And yes, people were adding to it as I walked through. Although my stroll through Pike Place Market was brief, it was almost time to head back to the hotel and rest my legs. So I stopped for lunch at a Chinese hot pot restaurant along the way. It felt good to get away from the crowd and enjoy more of that casual seaside ambience. And I even spotted some Sounders flags flying from surprising places. Oh, right, the hot pot restaurant. Ah, uh, if I'm being brutally honest, it was a bit of an awkward experience since I had never had hot pot before, so I made sure to thank the server profusely for their patience and help. A couple hours of rest at the hotel later, I slipped into my full rave green attire and made my way south to Occidental Square. You see, before every home game begins, there's a party that gathers in that area. With live music, face painting booths, games, and even a photo backdrop. I took some time to chat with a few other fans and even staff members at the park, the latter of whom looked genuinely surprised to know how long I had been a fan of the Sounders, despite being from a city that already had the most popular team in the league. All of these festivities in the park are organized by the team's supporters groups, who then gather up the fans for a full-scale march to the stadium. Even though I had tried to rehearse before arriving, I was so excited to finally be participating that I... forgot some of the lyrics to a couple of the chants. Thinking on the spot, I tried to fill in the gaps with a little bit of scarf raising and twirling. Nobody looked at me angrily, so I guess there's some truth in the old saying, fake it till you make it. And hey, I even got to cameo in a tweet from the official Seattle Sounders Twitter account, just very blurred out. Obviously, I had just been to Lumen Field the day before, but that was with a small tour group of 20 other people. Now, though, I was visiting the stadium with a game day crowd of about 32,500 people. It's one thing cheering for a team when you're watching them on a television from a living room on the other side of the country, but getting to finally join the Sea of Green was an incredible feeling, and I couldn't believe how great of a view I had. Despite buying cheap tickets, I was just above one of the near side corner flags. The only way I could be closer to the action was if I had pitch side seating, but that would cost me nearly ten times as much. As for the game itself, well, it was a little weird. The Colorado Rapids were the first to score, and they did so very early into the game. Rather than pressing for another, the Rapids chose to sit on that goal until close to halftime, when Jordan Morris finally broke through and equalized it for Seattle to massive applause. Then the second half began with Kellen Rowe getting a second yellow card for doing... whatever this was. 
but thanks to a penalty kick from Captain Nicolas Ladero, Seattle had the lead in the 71st minute, and the whole stadium was jumping from then until the final whistle. See, at the time, the Sounders were on a three-game losing streak, and an unusual goalless one at that. Being there when the streak was snapped in real time, I can tell you that Lumen Field lived up to its reputation as a loud, LOUD venue, and it wasn't even operating at full capacity. Before I left, I went over to the Emerald City supporters section to thank the leadership for all their hospitality both before and during the game, as it was a major part of the experience for someone like me, who can't normally do this. On the way back, I noticed that several buildings across downtown Seattle, including the city's tallest building, the Columbia Center, had their roofs lit green and blue, for what I hope was in celebration of the Sounder's win. That feeling of awe and appreciation was short-lived, however. As I was walking away from the stadium, I realized very quickly how much pressure I had put on my legs again, with all that marching and jumping. I could hardly feel them, but I was definitely limping back to the hotel. Because of how late it was, I grabbed some pizza to go, had a couple of slices while I watched the evening news, and then collapsed on the bed. What a day it was. Without a doubt, one of the best I've ever spent. Day 3 was my last full day in Seattle, and thanks to all my antics at the game the night before, I really needed to take things easy, lest I incurred any sort of long-term damage to my legs. This sadly meant having to cancel my side trip to go museum hopping in Bremerton. Instead, I went back to the waterfront to pick up some souvenirs for family and close friends, and then took the light rail to the suburban side of Seattle in Roosevelt. You see, one of the Sounders players co-owns a cafe in this area. His name is Freddy Montero, and he's from Campo de la Cruz, Colombia. This cafe, named Santo Coffee Company, specializes in Colombian coffee, serving a cup of Freddy's homeland with a modern, fair trade compliant dining experience. Now, Santo was already high on my list of priorities, but visiting after the big Sounders win the night before made it even more of a special treat. The drink I ordered was a panela latte, flavored with orange bitters and raw cane sugar. It was wonderful, and I even got to enjoy a brief chat with the cafe's other owner, Mikhail Givoronsky, before I left. It was a thoroughly enriching experience, but there was still one thing I had yet to do in Seattle. I hadn't gone to see the Space Needle. Sure, I had photographed it a couple of times, just chilling out in the distance, but that's not the same as going to see it in person. Getting there meant walking through the Queen Anne area, which was a bit of a trip, but it wasn't too much trouble on my legs. I even found a really nice statue of the city's namesake, Chief Seattle, on the way there, nestled in the trees that dotted the roads. Not the first monument to Chief Seattle I had spotted during my trip, since I found one in Pioneer Square earlier, but I do regret not reading more about his life so that I could better understand and appreciate statues like these. Within just a couple of minutes, I had entered the Seattle Center, with the base of the Space Needle coming into view. Going into the gift shop inside, I quickly ran into the same problem that I had encountered at Pike Place Market the day before. Too many people in too narrow of a space. As obligatory as a trip going up to the Space Needle's observation deck was, I felt much more comfortable just wandering around the Seattle Center and photographing the Space Needle, complete with its special anniversary bronze roof, amidst the scenery. Which leads me to the photobombing detail at the bottom here. See, when I was watching the local news back at the hotel, I found out I was visiting Seattle on the exact same weekend as this year's Pokemon Go Fest. I never got into the big Pokemon Go craze back in 2016, but it was still pretty cool seeing all the Pokemon-themed decor in the many parks of the Seattle Center. And yeah, I had escaped one crowd just to walk into another, but the spaces here were wide open, since most people focusing on the game were either sitting or standing on the sides so that other people could walk through. Although the Space Needle is the Seattle Center's most famous attraction, it's by no means the only one, as there's also the Museum of Pop Culture, or MOPOP for short, 
the Chihuly Gardens, the Pacific Science Center, and the Seattle Armory, which, despite its name and facade, is actually a small-scale mall. There was even this little Japanese shrine-looking building near one of the fountains. I don't think it was part of any actual shrine or temple, but it definitely had one of those cool tubular bells inside. Being at the Seattle Center meant that I could also get a glimpse of Climate Pledge Arena, home of the city's women's basketball team, the Seattle Storm, as well as its new hockey team, the Seattle Kraken. Unfortunately, July is anything but hockey season, so I couldn't actually go inside. At the very least, I could just about circle the building and get some nice photos of the exterior. Maybe next time, if I'm coming back in the winter. I even got to ride the Alwig monorail on my way out. You know, the thing that was built at the same time as the Space Needle, but hardly ever gets the same kind of attention and affection. It was actually quite nice, though not very long, and because of the designs printed on the cars, I couldn't get any photos or videos without them looking like sheets of accidental polka dots. I did get a photo of Monorail Man, though, but he appeared to be in jail. Free him. By now, the afternoon was making way for the evening, and my legs were telling me that I needed to stop for the day. So I bought a Seattle dog from a vendor near the hotel and brought it to a nearby park. If you've never heard of a Seattle dog, it's a hot dog with cream cheese spread inside the bun and then topped with grilled vegetables. It might sound a little weird, but trust me, it's worth trying, especially with sriracha sauce. As tasty as this one was, it wasn't as good as the ones I've made at home. So I finished my Seattle dog with a chuckle and a small feeling of pride in my own cooking, even if it was over something as simple as this. Back at the hotel, I ended the evening by catching up with friends and family, and then watching some local news and game shows. It was a quiet way to end the day, but I managed to enjoy myself without hurting my legs too much. It was a win-win for that alone. Alas, all good things must come to an end, and I only had enough to stay three full days in the Emerald City. That time was up, and now it was time to head home the same way I came in. My first flight to Denver left around lunchtime, so I had to leave the hotel halfway into the morning, hopping aboard the Light Link Rail once again. The past few times I rode the train, there was a sense of wonder and excitement about it. But now, it was sadness. A very deep sadness. I knew I couldn't stay here forever, at least not without a job and a place to live, but I was having so much fun that I didn't want to go back home. Whether I liked it or not, the train kept moving, and I watched as the skyline of Seattle grew ever fainter from the window. In its place, I was given one last gift before I left. The sight of Mount Rainier as majestic through my own eyes as I hoped it would be. Not long after photographing the mountain, the train had stopped at the SeaTac station, and my time in Washington State had finally reached its end. Compared to how empty the airport was when I arrived, SeaTac was packed like a tin of sardines this time, and the staff were in a rush to get everyone through security. Before I even had time to collect my thoughts, I was back in the air. This time around, I was able to look at all the natural scenery I had missed flying in, since it was prime daylight now. Mount Rainier looked even more breathtaking from the plane, and I couldn't help but quietly hum Roll On Columbia to myself as I saw this mighty river. I was absolutely captivated by the sights between Washington and Colorado from beginning to end. I'm not sure if this is what you could call a spiritual experience, but the best way I can put it is that I was realizing just how big and beautiful of a country the United States is. How important it is that we do what we can to preserve this for ourselves and those who will one day follow us. And how jealous I was of Idaho in particular for having the most consistently painting-worthy scenery. Indeed, before I had even realized the passing of time, the land below was a familiar palette of yellow-orange, and I was landing in Denver once again. Considering how my first experience with Denver's airport went, I was dreading the thought of getting stuck and potentially sick here again. But thankfully, it was only a short stay. 
After a mild trek across the airport, I was aboard the last flight of my trip, heading back home to Atlanta. The sun was already starting to go down while I was getting seated, so I'd be flying into the sunset, and there was something particularly poetic about ending the adventure that way. The flight from Colorado to Georgia was like an artist's palette board, splendidly showcasing the many colors of the sky, blending from one scene to the next. Unfortunately, tried as I did, I couldn't get very many good photos. This one, for example, was much more vibrantly pink in person, but my phone's camera could only capture this peach-toned hue. The same could be said of the deep blue skies of the coming nightfall soon after. They were much more saturated in person, I assure you. As those two scenes gave way to the final act, everything was once again covered in the Shroud of Midnight, until the lights of Atlanta came into view. For better or worse, I was back home. And that was my summer adventure to Seattle, a trip that fulfilled an almost decade-long dream of mine. Although I was limited by tight funds and accidental leg injuries, I thoroughly enjoyed my time in Seattle. Cheesy as it might be to say, it was everything I was hoping for, and more. The smell of sea salt and sight of fairies on the waterfront, the singing and shouting at Lumen Field, the endlessly picturesque scenery around the Seattle Center and the Space Needle, even little things like this public waterfall garden, and the simple beauty of taking photographs looking up and down the city's hills. Nothing about my trip to Seattle felt boring or dull, and I barely scratched the surface of things I could do there. In a weird way, I kind of felt at home in the Pacific Northwest, even though it was only my first time visiting. I don't know how long it'll be before I can see the Emerald City again, whether that takes another decade or just a couple of years, but one thing has been on my mind ever since I took that last photo of Mount Rainier from the plane window. Although the trip wasn't even a full week, it was the happiest I had been in a very long time. And I want to go back. Until then, I have plenty to remember Seattle by.